Samorelin, Pesamorelin, Ampomorelin, MK677. Man, when I first got into growth hormone secretagogues, I was really confused by their names and also confusing them with SARMs. And so today I want to go ahead and break down the growth hormone secretagogues and the two different categories and how they're used. So first thing to say, I think it'd be important for us to review growth hormone. When I think about growth hormone, I really think about the body's ability to regenerate and optimize the resources that it has. With my patients, I often talk about it like a house and you are remodeling or building on. When you have testosterone and insulin, your body's in this space of bringing in nutrients and starting to pack on size. Growth hormone goes up whenever we're fasted. Usually in the first hour of sleep is where you're gonna get your biggest spike. And what growth hormone does, it's kind of like testosterone and insulin are Christmas morning and growth hormones Christmas evening. You have all this new fun stuff coming in. You're trying to figure out where to put it and how to clean it all out. Growth hormones really good for regeneration. Now, from a lab perspective wise, we usually measure an IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor. And that's because growth hormone has a very short half-life, comes out of the brain, but it also stimulates the production of IGF-1 out of the liver, which depending on your source is usually 12 upwards to 24 hour half-life. So it's a much better lab marker to watch. And unfortunately, like most hormones, as we age, growth hormone decreases slowly. And so for many people, this leads to poor regeneration, poor sleep, Sleep and overall poor sense of well-being. And that's why optimizing it can definitely help you live a longer and healthier life. So first, let's start with the two different categories. We have the ghrelin agonists, or what we call the growth hormone releasing peptide agonists. And these popular secretagogues are going to be ampomorelin, MK677, and GHRPs. Now, most people don't use any of the GHRPs anymore because of side effects like prolactin, thyroid, and cortisol. So you usually comes down to picking between the two of them, MK677, which actually isn't a peptide. It's a small molecule, but hits the peptide receptor. So something very easily to get mixed up. And MK677 is orally bioavailable. Ampamorelin is often used by injection. Differentiating between the two, it seems like in my clinical experience that MK677, because we're hitting that ghrelin receptor, has a tendency to make us hungry. And for whatever reason, MK677 tends to make people more hungry than the ampomorelin. Now, switching over to the peptides that hit the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor in the brain. The three most popular, I would say, are arsimorelin, CJC1295, and tesamorelin. Tesamorelin is FDA approved in a drug called egrifta. Egrifta is FDA approved for weight loss, and it also helps with lipid issues. In the longevity space, though, I would say samorelin is probably the most popular one. CJC1295 and tesamorelin are thought of as more of a second second generation compared to Samorlin. As Samorlin does seem to have a shorter half-life, it's not quite as strong as CJC1295 and Tesamorelin. And Samorlin seems to have more side effects with cortisol, prolactin, and thyroid. So now that we've kind of differentiated them, how do we use them? MK677 is often used standalone, 10 to 25 milligrams nightly to induce an increase. And often in labs, we see a 50 upwards to 100% increase in IGF-1. The dosing is somewhere between 10 to 25 milligrams nightly. Tesamorelin is often used standalone, upwards from one milligram to two milligram. The issue with tesamorelin is that it's probably the most expensive out of all of the growth hormone peptides. So you have the MK677 that's standalone, you have the tesamorelin that's standalone, and you could technically use ampomorelin and CJC1295 standalone, but those two are often mixed together. The idea there is you're going to hit both growth hormone receptors to get an increased pulsatile reaction from the brain to release more growth hormone. Often with CJC ampomorelin, you're looking at 100 to 200 micrograms of each of them nightly. Now, comparing these to actual growth hormone, often for longevity purposes, many people People will use two to three IUs of growth hormone. Now, the issue in the United States is growth hormone. As a doctor, you're really not supposed to be writing for it off label. Meaning, as a doctor, if you stub your toe, I could write you for an antibiotic. That's within my scope of practice. Growth hormone is specifically reserved and controlled for people who have diagnosed very low growth hormone. So, having a suboptimal IGF 1, the FDA does not seem is a reason to give someone growth hormone. And you definitely can't give it for anti aging. 
purposes. With that being said, most people who are using growth hormone therapy are often spending at least a thousand to two thousand, maybe three thousand dollars a month, depending on how much they're using. Otherwise, they're going to the black market and buying it from overseas, Mexico, etc., which also comes with risks of making sure that you have high quality. And when you're injecting things as a doctor, I can't sit here and tell you, yeah, sure, go ahead and buy your growth hormone from the guy in the Gold's Gym's parking lot who got it from somewhere in China. Like, I have a medical license that I have to protect. And if something goes wrong, then I could get in trouble. So also a good place reminder, like this is not medical advice. You're not my patient. And you should always chat with a healthcare practitioner if these are things that you want to explore. Because the FDA has not regulated these. And the FDA has even come out and said, hey, we don't know how safe these things are. And we're not putting our neck behind it. So if you're using these peptides, it's good to remember that. So how do I use these in my clinical practice? So if a guy comes to me and he's interested in optimizing his growth hormone and he is trying to put on size, I would say he's better off going with an NK677, starting with 10, 20, 25 milligrams nightly, and then running that for 12 to 16 weeks. Often on the MK677, I see guys sleep much better. It increases their hunger, so it makes it easier for them to eat more calories and put on size. Often they say that they have an, a better mood, more energy, and that they're regenerating quicker and getting deeper sleep. On the other end, if someone says, hey, I'm really just trying to lean out, I like going with the CJC and Pomerelin combination, often doing 100 to 200 micrograms before bed. And I personally still do the five nights on, two nights off. I think this first started with Samoralin. Many people have said this is debunked. It's not necessary. My two cents is I think kind of like caffeine or any type of medication. If you can get a break from it from time to time, it allows the receptors to downregulate and it re-increases your sensitivity. Most people know if you start with 100 milligrams of caffeine a day and you increase and increase and increase, your body's sensitivity to it decreases and you have to increase the dose over and over again. There are some studies on CJC 1295 that the higher dose you go, you may induce some form of an immune reaction. It's often at very, very, very high doses, but I like staying away from those. So when I'm working with guys, my two cents is usually do 100 to 200 micrograms of a CJC Ampromorelin combination before bed. I also think it's extremely important when you're using the growth hormone peptides to not be eating a cupcake an hour or two before your injection. And the reason for that or any type of fast digesting carbs is when you eat fast digesting carbs, you release insulin and insulin and growth hormone work against each other. So your cells are fighting for their priority and often insulin is going to win and blunt your growth hormone. So if you're going to be using these, you really should be fasted away from carbohydrates at least two to three hours before your injection. And a side note, I think that's often why we see a good amount of weight loss because that alone will convince someone like, okay, I'm taking these growth hormone peptides. I want to stay from the carbohydrate heavy meals before bed. And that also can help induce deeper sleep. And other thing with growth hormone we didn't chat about earlier, it does a really good job of helping optimize our energy expenditure in the body. It's kind of like that X factor that helps our body figure out when am I using fat for energy? When am I using carbohydrates for energy? Should we tap into fat storages? Growth hormone is really that hormone that just optimizes everything. And with the CJC and Pirelin combination, we don't have a whole lot of clinical data. We don't have years and years of studies on it. So it seems up to this point, there aren't any real major risks that we found out, but it's always something to worth considering that anytime you're starting a new therapy, we don't know. We don't have a hundred peer reviewed double blind placebo controlled trials showing the safety and efficacy of a lot of these things. They are new. They are experimental. And I am for medical freedom. So for people who want to try out these things, I mean, there's plenty of herbs in nature. We don't have the same type of scientific research on. So you do you, but make sure you do your own research. And I would highly, highly recommend that you talk with a healthcare practitioner that these are things that you're interested in using. So overall, that was an overview of the growth hormone secreted gogs. If you've used these again, I'd love to hear your feedback. Maybe you have one I haven't heard of before, or maybe you've had some side effects that I didn't speak about today. Please help keep us all educated by leaving a comment below. Thanks for stopping by. If you made it this far, I think you'd appreciate this video. And until next time, stay vigilant, my friends, and God bless.